So welcome everyone. Um, I'm delighted to have you joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Christine Foster and I am the Vice President of Alumni Engagement at Christian Union. Um, and I'd like to thank our guests and our participants for joining us for a panel on Christian perspectives on healthcare in a pandemic. Um, I would like to also introduce my colleague, um, Karen Hetzler, who will um, share a little bit more about our Cornerstone Partners Program and um, then pray us in and then I'll introduce our doctors. Good evening. Thank you all for being with us tonight. I'm Karen Hetzler. I am the Assistant Ministry Director for Christian Union's New York Ministry. And we're so grateful to have this opportunity uh, to hear from our distinguished guests tonight, three physicians who from the previous hour with the Cornerstone Partner event, we've learned just have really wonderful differing perspectives, what this past year especially has been like for you all. So thank you for being with us here tonight. And we also, um, want to thank our Cornerstone partners, those of you who are already in partnership with Christian Union. We are incredibly grateful. Um, I am uh, amazed that I get to do this work. It's just a joy um, to be in this calling of developing Christian leaders to impact culture. And um, this is our commission from the Lord, and we certainly can't do it without you all. So thank you for those of you who are partners. And those of you who are not yet partners who may want to partner with the work that we're doing in developing Christian leaders, we truly believe that leaders matter. Um, and we are on all of the Ivy League campuses. We are in major cities, and especially in New York at this point. And then we also have a national arm of the ministry. And the goal of all of this in developing Christian leaders is national revival. We're not shooting small, we're seeking the Lord to really reach into the hearts of our people through, um, in one way, through our leaders. And you all have such tremendous potential for impact. So if you are not yet a partner with Christian Union, we invite you to join us in this adventure. Um, if you're in the New York area, we encourage you to feed into the work that's happening in New York. If you're an alumni of one of our schools, please consider partnering with one of those schools. If you're in, in none of those, we encourage you maybe toward the day and night ministry, which is the national arm of the ministry. And Christine has put a link here. Um, in the chat where you can jump on and partner in this incredible work with us to make an impact on our country. And so I'd love to pray us in and ask the Lord to guide this conversation. Lord Jesus, um, it is our great honor to be in your service as I prayed before the Cornerstone, Cornerstone Partner event. God, we are yours and we want to be used by you. We want to be um, we humble ourselves before you. We want even in this hour to be carved out so that you can pour in more of yourself. We want to be faithful ambassadors of your name and of your power. So Lord, we pray that even through this time, not only will you answer our questions through um, these servants of yours, but also, Lord, I pray that you, by your spirit and through them, would bring an incredible source of inspiration, that we aren't on this earth only to do our um, occupations, but to do them with the calling and the stamp that you have on our lives to truly impact culture by the power of your spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, lead this conversation. Would you bring the thoughts to mind that you want to have discussed tonight? There are so many questions on so many minds as we are um, battling almost a year in now to this pandemic. So God, you are the arbiter of truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Speak to us now lead us, um, calm any fears and concerns, and lead us ahead, Lord. May we be the light, the salt and light that you have called us to be. And we just bless each one of our guest speakers tonight. Lord, let your spirit and your anointing be on them. May they speak your words empowered by your heart and your love for us and for those who don't yet know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Karen. 
So um, now I'd like to go ahead and start by introducing our panelists. Um, and I will just go in alphabetical order. Um, so starting with Dr. Christopher Manassa. Uh, Dr. Manassa is the Associate Chief Medical Officer of Inpatient Operations at Boston Medical Center and a Clinical Associate Professor of Family Medicine at the Boston University School of Medicine. He joined the Department of Family Medicine in 2001 and is currently the Vice Chair for Inpatient and Hospital Services. From 2018 to 2020, Dr. Manassa served as the Interim Chair for the Department of Family Medicine at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Manassa graduated from Kilpak Medical College, University of Madras, India, and then completed his family medicine residency training at In His Image Family Practice Residency Program at Hillcrest Medical Center, Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1997. Chris completed the Duke University National Faculty Development Workshop Series from 1997 to 1999 and served as the Associate Inpatient Director at a 550 bed tertiary care hospital in North Carolina between 1997 and 2001, where he received the Teacher of the Year Award from the Family Medicine Residence three out of the four years he was there. Chris has also received the Teacher of the Year Award from Boston University Family Medicine Residency six times over the last 15 years. Um, and so we welcome Chris and we thank him for, um, for being part of this panel this evening. And you'll hear more from each person too about what they specifically have experienced in this last year. So jumping on to Dr. Vincent Naiman. Uh, Dr. Naiman has been a plastic and reconstructive surgeon in Columbus, Georgia since 1995. His private practice includes covering trauma, wounds, and cancer reconstruction for the major hospitals in his region, as well as maintaining a state licensed and Medicare certified ambulatory surgery center for outpatient and cosmetic surgery. He is also an adjunct professor for the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine their Georgia campus, where he gives clinical instruction to third and fourth year medical students. For a decade, Dr. Naiman has also worked with Chosen International Medical Assistant, making annual medical mission trips to Mexico. Originally from New York City, Dr. Naiman is a product of the New York City public schools, including Stuyvesant High School. Um, from there, he attended and graduated from Princeton University and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine at Yeshiva University. He completed a general surgery residency at New York Medical College and plastic surgery fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. Um, while at Einstein, Dr. Naiman met Diane Binns, a nursing student at Columbia, um, and they have four children and three grandchildren. Um, and his solo practice is called Chattahoochee Plastic Surgery, and it is managed by his wife, Diane. They committed to having a faith-based practice, one led by biblical principles, proclaiming the gospel and offering prayer with patients. And he says they have witnessed God's faithfulness at the practice as it has grown and thrived. So thank you, Dr. Naaman, for being with us. And last but not least, Dr. Catherine Walters. Dr. Walters is a board certified emergency medicine physician in Charlotte, North Carolina. She attended Princeton University, where she was an early participant in Christian Union's ministry there. She graduated from Princeton in 2004, and in 2009, she earned a medical degree from the University of Florida College of Medicine. She practices with U.S. Acute Care Solutions. In 2019, she was named the Physician of the Year at her hospital. She served for several years also as, the executive, as an executive on our alumni board supporting the ministry at Princeton for Christian Union. Um, she previously worked in biomedical research for the Department of Defense at USHSAS, which is Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. 
She is a member of the American College of Emergency Physicians and previously served on the American College of Emer Emergency Physicians Ethics Committee. So we thank her very much for being with us. Um, and we look forward to asking questions of all of these fine folks. Um, um, so we have some questions prepared, um, but I would also welcome people to ask questions um, through the chat. Um, one thing I do want to say is that um, obviously all of these folks have different experiences and bring um, different points of view and that they are each speaking for themselves, um, not for their institutions or for Christian Union, but we very much value the breadth of um, perspectives that they bring to the table and we're so grateful to have them with us. Okay. Um, yeah, so Karen asked me a clarifying question, which is, do we want things through Q&A or chat? Why don't we have questions through Q&A, please? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to start us with a couple of questions, and then hopefully we'll have time to get to audience questions as well. So I'd love to ask our physicians to speak a little bit about what this period, this last year, um, has been like for you specifically. And we've obviously chosen people intentionally who have very different experiences. Even though you all work in healthcare, you have very different experiences of what the last year has been like. Um, so both a little bit about what your year has been like, but also about how you sense God has been working in your life during this last year. Christine, I can go if you want me to. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to Christian Union. Um, personally, I think I'm grateful for the opportunity God's given me to serve in such a time that we faced um, um, a pandemic in once in a century. And um, a few things that God has taught me along the way in the past year one is to be gracious with those who disagree. Um, a lot of uh, questions swirling around, is this real, is this not? And um, so, so just being gracious with people, I think personally that uh, has been a recurring theme that God's been talking to me. And professionally, I know that um, we're always hard pressed for time and um, God's allowed me to learn to be more generous with my time. Uh, to be genuine and transparent when I interact with patients and um, and to be open to his uh, spirit when he's called me to say a word of encouragement or not say something when I'm about to say something that probably would not be reflecting uh, Christ and his character. So um, it, it's been uh, a difficult time, but I think the... Um, the one thing that I've learned is that um, I used to rush um, through my day and I've been forced to step back and just be uh, intentional with the time I spend with patients and um, listen to them more than saying things. And I think um, everybody is with the isolation, the fear and anxiety has been heightened and um, so people really appreciate when you spend time talking to them. I also do a lot of telemedicine besides seeing patients in the hospital. So um, in one sense, the telemedicine has actually, we spend more time with patients uh, talking to people. And it seems like even in the midst of a crisis, uh, God can use uh, an opportunity like this uh, to uh, minister to people and, um, so that's been my growth journey in the last year. Sure, I, um, I've been working more on the um, traditional, what people think of when they think of the front lines, um, working um, basically as a, uh, as a physician, just in the emergency department for the last 11 months. And it's to, to it's been an incredibly challenging year. Um, I it's a lot of challenges you wouldn't expect. I think um, definitely I've learned 
from to, about reliance on the Lord, um, because it's been a uh, some just the the sheer particularly I think in the first half of the, uh, half of the pandemic when just the sheer exhaustion um, from working clinically and then coming home and attempting to learn basically in your remaining waking hours everything you could about this new disease that was emerging and there was a, a about a four or five month period of time when the data was changing almost on a daily basis um, so trying to uh, and uh, but I do think. Um, so, so I, uh, and then very much of what um, Dr. Manasseh said about um, you know, learning when to speak and when not to speak and grace towards, towards one another and what has been a turbulent year for a great number of reasons, not just this pandemic. Um, but um, yeah, just from how it's impacted our group, it's, it, it has been very, very trying in some ways. I mean, I, I did lose one of my uh, staff members to COVID and um, I'm several staff members in our hospital system, we did lose to COVID. Some have been very sick as well. Um, so that has been sort of an emotional and psychological toll in addition to sort of the, the stress of attempting to learn about a new disease. But I think um, the, the fact that I can be in 2021 and, and, and smiling and feeling joy is definitely, is definitely the grace of the Lord. Um, and um, so sometimes it's hard to identify one specific thing, but just how he's slowly and, and quietly and um, sometimes audibly <laughs> sustained um, throughout what has been a, a difficult period. Very good. Well, um... If, uh, if Katie's on the front line, then you might call me the back line. Uh, as a plastic surgeon, uh, my utility specifically for COVID was not very high. And a lot of what uh, COVID did for me was to uh, uh, humble myself and uh, taught me the humility of, of being a physician who didn't have that uh, critical you know, life-saving tools for what our country was going through, what our world was going through. And so, um, you know, that was very difficult for me as a physician. Um, I also run a business, uh, much like a restaurant or any other business. It's a non-essential service of plastic surgery, which meant I stopped working for um, uh, six weeks, uh, stopped doing surgery for six weeks, and then uh, only did uh, more urgent type of uh, surgeries for another six weeks. So uh, my practice was much different than how it had been for a, a period of three months. Um, but um, I did have, uh, I did find some utility in that I have a surgery center, which was able to uh, be a husbandry for uh, personal protective equipment that we stored up uh, in, participa in anticipation of needs at the hospital, emergency rooms. Uh, since I run an operating room, I have ventilators available that could be used. And so basically just made these uh, resources available to my community. And um, also as a uh, medical person in the community, a spokesperson to, to, to sort of, uh, as, as Chris uh, suggested, to dispel myths and to, and to shed light on truths about what this is and, and, and what we can do and to move forward. And uh, probably the, the last thing, uh, how it affected me was it really showed me, um, you know, who I worship. I know I worship the Lord. We all do. We're Christians. I get that. But when certain things are taken away from you, the grief you feel reflects how important you allow that to become for yourself. And uh, that was a very humbling experience. And I feel like it's helped to reorient me in terms of how I see myself in the greater context of my community and the greater context of God's kingdom. So it's been quite enlightening in that respect. That's a, a powerful witness for sure, Vince. Thank you for that. Um, so one of our other physicians in the, um, in the audience, um, Dr. John Crane um, from the University of Buffalo asks, um, have you noted any increased openness on the part of your medical colleagues to discuss spiritual things in this era of COVID-19? I can answer that. Um, you know, as, uh, as you guys know, I'm working in a uh, safety net academic medical center, and we have uh, a Christian fellowship for medical students at Boston University, but we really didn't have any formal uh, group for physicians. Uh, there's a ton happening at the student level, at the residence level, but none for the faculty, um, nothing formal. And uh, almost two weeks into the pandemic, um, spontaneously people with uh, like-minded faith. Uh, we know who we are. We got together and we've had weekly Bible study and prayer. 
um, though not, uh, I'm not able to join them um, on a regular basis in the early on in 2020, the spring, uh, I was part of that group and it really was uh, refreshing to see A, supporting each other, encouraging each other and uh, praying for each other. It was just half an hour once a week, but uh, it, it really kind of uh, brought to light that um, there are like-minded people and uh, it takes a pandemic to uh, come out of our closet, so to speak, and band together as believers. So um, that uh, has been very refreshing. Yes, I think there was a much more open conversation for a lot of us just um, about about our faith, simply because at the very beginning of this and before we had treatment protocols and all we knew is it was this deadly virus, a lot of us were making our wills back in April or updating them. So there was, because uh, we, we just didn't know so much back then, we just knew this bad disease was coming. And so I think that that opened up a, a new level of, um, of uh, just vulnerability. And I definitely, I think people were um, were open, and and I think too, as as isolation kicked in, um, where people, a lot of conversations came up about where people were finding their community. Yeah, that's powerful for sure. Vince, you have anything to add on this, or should I move on to another question? Yeah, you can go ahead and move on. I, I concur with with. Uh... Katie and Chris were saying. Great. Um, one thing I wonder is, as you look around you, um, how do you think your response as a Christian is different than other healthcare providers around you who are not Christian? Uh, Christine, I can answer that. Um, I think the, the first thing that patients want is honesty and uh, uh, being true to both what uh, are factual and what you believe uh, personally. And I think, um, you, you know, there, there, there are tendencies to exaggerate something or kind of overblow, you know, uh, say things that are, we don't fully understand or grasp, particularly early on in the pandemic, things were evolving very rapidly. Uh, certain treatments were in place and then those treatments were not um, administered anymore. So uh, when patients started asking questions, uh, they wanted honest answers, um, not something that uh, we feel comfortable a lot of times as physicians to admit that we don't know certain things, right? And I think um, the more that people heard from me that, you know, I'm totally not sure, but this is what I know and this is how I can explain what's going on, people appreciated that. And I think uh, um, there was a sense from uh, not all of them, but a few of our, the physician in the physician community that they got a grasp of the situation early on and uh, probably with good intentions, uh, but it wasn't serving the larger purpose. So I think uh, as a physician, uh, the humility, as uh, uh, Vince said early on, to be humble enough to admit that we don't know all the answers, um, but we actually rely on our creator who created us in his image to know exactly what's going on. And I think that to me was uh, highlighted through this whole period. And it, it's difficult at times to admit that we don't know certain things. Um, and actually to say it, I think philosophically we can admit it, but to be bold enough to admit it to a patient is hard. Um, but um, I think patients begin to appreciate that. And then their trust builds and they listen to you more, um, so. Yeah, I, I agree with what Chris is saying. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm down here in, in Georgia, so we're in the Bible Belt, and uh, uh, pretty much, uh, I don't have a lot of examples of non-Christian uh, healthcare givers down here, which is, a, which is a blessing in some respects. But I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, um, we as, as Christian uh, healthcare providers, or, or we just see things in a, in a slightly different perspective, you know, and, and one of them uh, came about in, in the use of uh, masks. And uh, I, my church has asked me to talk about this for the, for the church. 
And I think the perspective that, that I have, I'm sure many of you have, is that, you know, since these masks that we're asked to wear are much more effective at preventing us from giving COVID to someone else than it is at protecting us from getting it, it is such a great example of Christian love. You know, it's a, it's, you do it for the sake of others and, and you're giving for the sake of others. And I think that perspective has helped a lot of people understand, you know, why it's a, it's a good thing to do. And um, I just can't believe that you'd come up with that same perspective or understand it as well outside of the Christian framework. I think to follow my earlier kind of um, comment, just the 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 peace that comes from um, knowing that no no matter what illness may befall me or my family members, I have several family members that are also in clinical jobs as well, and so we had multiple people in my family and extended family on the front lines more simultaneously. And as much as you worry about yourself, you worry about your family member as well. And I think just ultimately that anxiety was not, I saw in lots of, lots of colleagues, but um, definitely, I think as the Christian, my Christian colleagues, there's a, a, there was definitely a underlying sense of peace that was very different, um, simply because you know um, that, that we were under, under God's care and plan. So, um, let's see, another thing that I know folks brought up um, earlier was um, what you have seen in your practice um, about healthcare disparities in our communities um, and what you think we are called to do as Christians to respond to that kind of thing. Uh, Christine, I've worked in an uh, organization that cares 70% of patients who don't speak English as their primary language. And um, uh, the community in East Boston was uh, particularly affected in spring 2020. And with the second surge, they, are, they continue to be the highest uh, 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 the percentage of patients who've been affected. And early on when uh, folks in East Boston were um, getting infected with the virus and actually were incredibly uh, disproportionate in mortality and morbidity. Uh, we realized that um, the information that was being uh, passed along to folks in the community were actually in English and not in Spanish. And um, like wearing a mask and social distancing, people didn't even know what was being talked about. And uh, it was very sad and I, and I think um, it, it made me appreciate um, uh, that we, we, we take for granted a lot of things that, and we don't, uh, sometimes at least I can talk for myself, um, just communication, right? We just assume that there's social media, there's internet, whatever, people are gonna understand, they're gonna get it. But um, we soon realized as an organization that this wasn't being universally communicated in the right forum and in the right language. So. Um, and, and to top it all, um, uh, those are the folks that actually have to be coming into work every day. They needed their job, they needed to work, and they were the essential workers and working in the grocery store, working in facilities and the food industry. So, um, uh, and it, uh, it highlighted to me uh, an extra sense of being not just empathetic, but compassionate, but also um, being intentional to live out my Christian faith, to demonstrate 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13. What is true love? What does Christ's love look like? And um, I, while I was working in the hospital on the inpatient unit, uh, I used to spend a lot of time uh, talking to family members more than patients and just to encourage them to adopt um, safety measures and not to become infected. And uh, one particular individual told me, look, I'm eight, we are eight people in our family in a two bedroom apartment. You really think we can distance ourselves like the way you're talking about? So it made me realize that, um, you know, we can say all the right things, we can, we can do all the right things, but uh, uh, there are certain things that we just can't o overcome. And, um, and in moments like that, what, uh, I, I had to rely on uh, uh, reflecting God's compassion and, and, and just to listen with 
um, with kindness and um, listen to their um, frustration, their, their tears. And, um, you know, I, I'm a very kind of, um, I love to touch people. I love to sit and talk to people and I couldn't do that. And uh, it, it was very hard for me. I went into family medicine because I love families. And there was, it, there was a time that I felt um, I wasn't doing enough because I, I just couldn't uh, hug a patient when they needed it, you know? Uh, we had to stand back, we had to put a mask on. So we, we, we basically uh, talked to people using an iPad so they could at least see our faces before we walked in with our PPE. And um, so that was uh, one immediate change that we did that we felt like connected to the patient and uh, it helped a lot because my role was not the medicine. There wasn't much medicine to give, but speak hope and, and be optimistic and instill some faith that you're gonna come through this. And whatever tools we have in our hands, we'll do, use it um, so that you can get through the situation. So um, the, the disparity was obvious, but I think um, it allowed me to be grateful for the privilege that I have and also be intentional in my walk as a Christian. If I could just, um, I think those are great points that uh, that Chris makes, and if I could just add to that um, a bit, is that it's difficult to to uh, educate your patients with the backdrop of a history of of healthcare disparities, um, uh, shameful histories of um, of experimentation that was uh, certainly uh, apart from medical and ethical uh, boundaries, and and you're fighting an uphill battle sometimes when people whose whose memory of those are are, are fresh and, and feel as though they can't trust everything that, that the healthcare uh, system is telling them um, can can uh, actually worsen these disparities as uh, people are slow to adopt the recommendations of their healthcare providers. Yeah, I think the pandemic highlighted disparities that were already there, but magnified tenfold. I think um, Chris brought up the point, like if, someone, if eight people live in a two-bedroom apartment, they, they can't quarantine. Um, people who rely on public transit to get from place to place are going to necessarily have increased exposure. Um, and also the, you know, the um, skill set and the ability to access virtual care um, and um, just being having access to the kind of streaming services and, and technology to be able to do that when doctors' offices are closed um, and a lot of individuals found themselves in the emergency department and therefore increased their exposure yet again. Um, so I think that the pandemic um, highlighted basically every problem, every every um, every gap in the healthcare system um, was was glaringly, unfortunately, um, brought for uh, brought forth uh, and exacerbated in this pandemic. I think certainly as a Christian, I um, became much more convicted this year about my responsibility to advocate for those who, uh, for my position of privilege, for those who do not have that position of privilege. Um, and I think um, that, that that has been um, something that I've been, that's been a, a work in progress for me about how to best best do that from my position, um, but certainly feeling very much called um, to do that with a much more vocal standpoint than ever previous. So um, obviously we're heading into a new season um, with the availability of vaccines. Um, and one of our folks asks, what might be an acceptable reason to decline vaccination? Um, and this person is wondering if you believe that vaccination will remain voluntary. Um, they write, I have personal reservations and I am becoming increasingly aware of growing hostility towards those of us with this viewpoint. I, uh, Christine, volunteered to uh, staff vaccine uh, booth uh, Q&A in our uh, hospital. So we opened uh, a, a vaccine uh, booth um, for employees. Um, and um, this particular question uh, has been raised many times. And my response has been, um, uh, as an institution, uh, it, right now it's voluntary and I would always advocated to be voluntary, that it has to be a personal choice. Um, 
that the um, I explained to them the, the way the vac vaccine works. Um, I was able to get a very a simple um, graph of how it works so that um, folks who don't uh, understand uh, the mechanism would be easily able to understand how it works. And despite everything that I say, people are like, no, I don't believe this. I, I feel like you're injecting DNA into my body. I feel like it's going to affect my um, um, fertility. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, um, you know, turned into something else. And I don't want this no matter what you say. Uh, I, I basically say, I appreciate what you're saying. I respect your decision and uh, it's your choice. And, uh, and I always end up by, by saying that, look, um, I have been very skeptical in my life about anything new. And I, I chose to take the vaccine um, because uh, primarily to A, to be a role model for my patients, that those that are vulnerable, those that are at the highest risk of getting the disease will be protected from the disease from what we know. And, um, and B is to um, demonstrate that it's safe. I've gotten both the doses and uh, you know it's probably not the same for everyone. Um, so uh, lay the facts, uh, make sure that people understand where you stand in terms of um, making sure that it's a personal decision, it's a choice. No one's going to be forcing anybody to take this and then let it speak for itself. So I think, um, you know, after all that, I, I can uh, give an example of, well, one of the medical assistants came to me, I know her really well. And she said, look, my grandmother is 99. She got the COVID, she survived. I'm not gonna get the vaccine. Um, and I said, that's fine. You don't have to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to force you. And she said, I respect you. I know you so well, but I'm still not going to take it no matter what you say. So I think um, it, it's um, the personal decision and that uh, people have to make their own uh, choice. But uh, my job is to lay the facts and make sure people understand why we're doing this. Yeah, that's a, that's a frequent conversation I've had with a lot of people in the healthcare community as well. And I, I answer this in full disclosure as someone who lined up, uh, I was tier 1A, um, a, like the first priority group. So we were the first round of people to get the vaccines and I was there the first day. Um, so, um, but I think everything is risk versus benefit. And I agree, yeah, it has to be uh, someone that each individual weighs their personal risk versus benefit and their understanding. Um, always more than happy to answer any questions someone might have um, to help them better, to be able to better understand what their risks and what their benefits are. Um, but certainly as to, I, just, to just, sub, just to give supposition without ad, advocating for one position or the other, I doubt it would ever be truly, um, truly mandatory in this country. country. I, I doubt I would advocate for that. Um, but I, as to whether other countries choose to, to have it be mandatory, it wouldn't surprise me if they do, simply because there is track record for that. The thing that jumps to mind is someone who's an avid international traveler, um, my yellow fever um, vaccinations and documentation, many countries do still require that as mandatory to enter the country. So um, I, you know, as to whether or not other countries will, will make it mandatory, quite Quite possibly. I mean, again, it's um, who knows. Um, but in this country, I would be surprised if it ever. If I would, be, I think it would be highly unlikely that it ever would become mandatory. Um, and then I, I guess that's my my. But um, if you yeah, said I I opted to get the to get the vaccine, I got the Pfizer, um, and um, ha happy I did it. <laughs> I, I also got the uh, Pfizer vaccine and, and did well. Of course, that's an anecdotal um, experience, but I was certainly um, very happy to have the opportunity to be vaccinated. But I want to kick it back to my colleagues who are closer to the front line. Uh, I think part of the question is also asking, are there the medical reasons why you shouldn't get the vaccine? Like uh, if you're immunocompromised or on other medications or have other underlying health matters, could either of you speak on that question? Right now, I, um, basically, there are a few, depending on which vaccine, because depending on the different vaccines there, if you are um, have a known, um, I believe, a known previous allergic reaction to previous vaccinations, um, they, are, they are not recommending right now um, that, that you get it. Um, there are... Um, 
And, but right now, I think that is the only, the, the only solid contraindication that I, that I'm aware of. And Dr. Manassa, I know you may, you may be more familiar with some of the current, um, the current policies right now, but that's the only one that I can think of offhand right now that is a um, outstanding, like absolute recommendation on behalf of the, the uh, governing bodies. Yeah, I agree with uh, Catherine on that. Um, there isn't any um, known contraindication for immunocompromised individuals. Uh, Vince, that's been a question that's oft uh, asked about from uh, colleagues um, who have immunocompromised state or on immunosuppressive therapy. Um, and they are actually at the highest risk, as you know, of uh, uh, getting the disease. And I think I agree with Catherine that you always have to weigh the risk and benefits. And just like anything else that we do, right? There's always risk to anything, treatment, testing, whatever it is. Um, so, um, and if for the individual, if the risk outweighs the benefit, then don't take it. Um, but if the benefit outweighs the risk, of course. And I think, um, you know, um, the, uh, the older individuals, and I'm sure you've seen this study as well, uh, it's uh, obviously in the public domain, uh, people who are older than over 50 seem to respond better to the vaccine than people who are younger in terms of side effects. And um, there were only 11 uh, side effects per million uh, with the Pfizer vaccine. So, uh, and a lot, I mean, quite a few million people have already received it in our country. So I think um, the, 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 the bigger question is uh, how effective it is and how long can you be protected from COVID? And I, and I think obviously that's an unknown um, in terms of the duration of uh, immunity and protection. So, um, so yeah, I, I, there isn't anything beyond what uh, I can add to what Catherine has said so far. Uh, I just want to uh, add one small thing, though. Um, apparently, the Moderna, more so than the Pfizer, uh, may cause swelling if you've had um, fillers, facial fillers. And that's one of the warnings that came down from the American Society of Plastic Surgery. So if you've had fillers, it may cause swelling. If you can get the Pfizer, that might be the better option for you. Not life-threatening, but just something to know. Thanks, Vince. Um, there are a couple of questions that touch on the, um, the sort of political poll that we have. I would say both sides sort of saying, no, this is misinformation. No, this is misinformation. Um, so without um, taking the political side, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about how as faithful people, it's possible to assess what um, the information and data is out there, but also how we might pray into trying to understand what God is calling us to do in the midst of this situation. Can you touch a little bit on that? Sure, Christine, I usually use my personal experience um, more than anything else when I talk to patients and anybody who has questions um, I, a third of my patients right now in the outpatient practice have had COVID and um, on an any given day, I mean, I could just guarantee that one third of my patients would have had COVID. It's, it's so common. And um, while not all of them have uh, post-COVID uh, complications, quite a few of them have symptoms that they attribute they never had before. I cannot disprove that, uh, but they are real symptoms. And so when people question um, the, uh, the, uh, whether this is real, whether this is accurate, I basically have to tell folks that, look, I, I'm encountering real people with real symptoms. And uh, I, uh, I, um, I, I've seen uh, folks that have dramatically changed. Uh, I mean, I know of a nurse who uh, has been my patient for more than 10 years who um, obviously, he's a very um, intelligent, smart guy. He got COVID. Two of his sisters got COVID. They died. And uh, this guy survived. Then he's hardly 50. He got a stroke six weeks after he got discharged from the hospital. And then we thought that everything was fine. And then six weeks ago, he had acute congestive heart failure and uh, ended up he, he had a myocardial infarction. So I mean, things are just uh, so unpredictable. Um, well, it, the, it, is it all stemming from COVID? I don't know, but he was a totally fine guy before all this happened. So, um, so I think, uh, you know, that's just an example of how I, the way I encounter, how I uh, kind of respond to uh, 
um, questions, conspiracies, is like, you know, look, I've seen pe people both in the outpatient setting and of course in the hospital when um, seeing quite a few people die, you know, uh, and um, so uh, that's the way I respond. Uh, one way, another um, kind of way, yes, yes, I have certainly seen lots of disinformation on the, on Facebook. Actually, I was speaking with a few of my colleagues, we kind of talked about what's been difficult about this year. Arguably, the um, trying to come home and then deal with the disinformation or the misinformation campaign or just the, uh, the some of the, um, I'd say, I would say, anger, I guess is the best word I can use towards the healthcare establishment um, has been probably the, arguably one of the more difficult things about this year, one of the more demoralizing and exhausting things, um, even more so than the actual um, patient care. I, one, one specific example, just because that, that, that was an specific example I dealt with, there was a period of time when uh, one piece of information was making the rounds that um, doctors were falsifying uh, death certificates to um, up bill for COVID-19. And, and as a physician who fills out death certificates, um, that was really hard to see um, you know, people that I knew and cared about putting that on their social media and spreading that. And, um, and one way I kind of said, talked about it was just engage, engage in conversation and be like, did you, and I'll be honest, most of the time people had no idea that I was one of those people. I was one of those people who fill out death certificates. Um, and as I, so engaging in conversation saying, you know, when you, when you say that, that, that impacts me and a lot of people that I'm friends with and know, and it's really difficult for me to, to hear you say that. What, what made you think that? And I'll, I'll, I was like, I never thought that was you. I thought that was someone else out there. Um, and so I think engaging and, and building upon those personal relationships that are built in, and for many, for many of these relationships built in, in our faith and, and in Christ and having that, that undercurrent of, of trust and that depth of that relationship that's built on a very solid foundation allowed us to engage in, in conversations that I probably um, would have been a lot more difficult to have otherwise. And so I think, um, and understand that when, when a lot of times when, um, you know, people, we're all under tremendous stress. My stress is different than the stress of the person who, who lost their, their job and is at home, um, you know, struggling. To, we're all coming from a, a place of profound difficulty throughout the last year. And um, I think just trying to understand that even when, when someone shares something like that, they're, they're sharing it from a, a place of, of frustration and anger and, and, and trying to address that and, and using our, the relationships and, the, and the, our, our family of Christ and building upon that as a means to engage in dialogue. Uh, I certainly agree that that so much of this has uh, has been politicized, and and almost sort of, if it wasn't so if it wasn't so dangerous, it, it would almost be absurdly funny. But um, people's behavior almost are, seems to be to to convey a political conviction of their own, you know, particularly people's you know not wearing masks or not uh, being compliant with social distancing. And the undercurrent, whether they say it or not, just like Chris pointed out, the question of, is this COVID real? Are the numbers real? You know, uh, are they just taking uh, um, cases of the flu and trying to label it as cases of COVID just to boost the numbers? I mean, anybody in healthcare would know these are, these are bizarre. These are bizarre, but it seems like it's to, it's to feed into some sort of underlying, uh, you know, political belief. And it takes a fair amount of restraint to address these concerns from the point of view of real information, uh, from the you know with a spirit of love, uh, Christian love, uh, for their point of view, and um, you know just not to get um, you know uh, unchristian like in your in your response, um, but it, it certainly is challenging, and uh, unfortunately, unlike a lot of other debates, the stakes are just way too high to allow uh, misinformation to get to get out. So it's, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, just to add to what uh, Catherine said is uh, the other thing that I've used is also to explain to people the sacrifices that uh, physicians have made, residents, physicians, residents. Um, you know, I, I know of a lot of my colleagues who sl uh, slept in the garage because they had little kids, older parents, they didn't want to go in. Um, so a couple of them sent their kids away to their, their parents' home. And um, very little kids, you know, I don't have little kids, but uh, I, I can't imagine how it is to be separated from 
your child and to sacrifice day after day, week after week, um, uh, being in the hospital. And, um, you know, and I explain to people also how it's, it's not easy to wear PPE and stay there for 12 hours during an inpatient shift. It's, I, I know Catherine can attest to that. It's incredibly hard. And, uh, and, and I think when I try to explain all that, we're not doing this because we don't, we don't think this is real. I mean, uh, we should be crazy if we don't think it's real, right? So, and, uh, and from a medical standpoint, from a, a clinical standpoint, I mean, the, the inflammatory markers, I'm sure, Catherine, you know that, and Vince, you probably know that as well. Huge uh, uh, numbers that I've not seen before. I mean, this is like totally different, totally new. So I think a lot of the um, you know, people that do have questions and, you know, and, and, and they have a right to question. No one's saying it's not uh, their right to question. But I think when we present the facts and be gentle about it and be gracious about it, uh, I think, um, you know, we may not be able to convince people, but at least um, have an opportunity to respond. Super, thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's a tough time for sure, for people to understand what's going on. So we appreciate your um, perspective on it. Um, a couple of other questions people have asked, and I we don't have a ton of time left, but just to throw some out. Um, one, um, of our participants asked, do you see any progress in early stage outpatient COVID treatment that could keep people out of the hospital? In my community, we've just started monoclonal antibody therapy. Um, that's, rel that's a relatively new to my community. That is the one that I am aware of that's more of a pre-hospital um, treatment right now. There's a very strict inclusion criteria for it. Um, and it's a, uh, you've got a finite window of when to identify the people for whom it's appropriate and when to administer that. But there does seem to be some early evidence that that is a um, potentially a, a successful therapy. Um, again, I always say this tentatively because one thing we found when, when studying a lot of, of, of the experimental therapies that you've seen coming in and out of the news is it looks good in, in certain kinds of, and then when you actually put it through the ringer and give it the true, um, the true full court randomized control trial, um, vigorous testing, it doesn't hold up. But um, right now that is the one that I'm aware of that is actively sort of being used widespread in the United States is the um, is the monoclonal antibody infusions done pre-hospital. Yes, agreed. So another question folks are asking is, um, how are you behaving differently in terms of masks or social distancing, if at all, after getting vaccinated? Um, I'd like to start, you know, um, I'm committed to uh, continuing to wear my mask um, as a, uh, a show of solidarity with all those who are uh, who are doing so and should be doing so. Um, I think that it is the wisest thing not to have a two-tier mask system where people flash a card and say, oh, no, 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 I've been vaccinated, so I'm going to just cough and sneeze all over Walmart. Um, not to mention, you know, being a marketer, I've got the mask that... Uh, Markets my own practice, so that that's helpful too. Or my favorite football team, or, or other other, you know, just keep it fun. But um, I want to maintain these habits. I believe that um, these habits are going to be so important throughout 2021. Um, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I defer to my other doctors, but I don't think you know we're we're really seeing uh, a, a near end to this and to the habits that we've had to develop. So uh, I'm doing that. Um, I've tried to find some ways for uh, my wife and I to uh, uh, get out of Columbus, you know, to drive somewhere, uh, um, just find a place to go where we can still be safe and, uh, and just change our environment every so often. But um, I'm certainly keeping up the same um, criteria, even though uh, I, I've been vaccinated. My wife is also a nurse. Uh, she's awaiting her second uh, shot as well. So. So jumping in with what I think may be um, the final question that we have time for, um, and I, I think it's a really interesting one. So um, there, folks mentioned there is an increasing view of science as God in the public square, especially among medical professionals. Um, 
what do you think that means for you as a Christian healthcare provider? I think I've always relied on um, a verse, um, 1 Chronicles 16, 25. Uh, it's actually a song as well. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He's to be feared above all gods. Uh, anything that exalts uh, uh, above God can occupy the place of God, right? I mean, anything or anyone. Um, so my, my view has always been to uh, be grounded first that um, Jesus Christ is my Lord and uh, he's the only name about, that I will bow down to. Uh, and um, for, once you're grounded in the faith and in the Lord, using medicine as a tool um, and not worshiping medicine as a God, I think uh, it can only be done um, more by walk than by talk. That when people realize that you're not placing so much emphasis on um, medicine, but allowing God to use medicine and allowing God to use you as his instrument, um, uh, I think it's the best way forward. Um, because we can easily be, uh, we can get caught in, in the trap of medicine and science becoming a God. So, um, so I think we gotta be vigilant as Christians, uh, especially as uh, Christian physicians uh, it's uh, easy to slip and fall. Um, so it's it's a daily thing, I think. Yeah, that's that's wonderful, Chris. I like to I like to add to that. You know, to me, uh, you know, science is a is a wonderful uh, uh, estimation of, of how things will turn out in the physical world, uh, but but we are beholden to the spiritual world, and and um, you know, science can never replace. Uh, the power and the and the mystery and the might of God. I mean, even the as much as science describes, it leaves out so many. Uh, it leaves out the answers to so many questions. Um, and so, science looks smart by only, you know, espousing the answers of questions that they can't answer, but so much that they cannot. Um, as a physician, I, I feel privileged, especially as a surgeon, to be able to uh, explore and learn and understand and be a part of his. Holy creation, uh, just to just to have a glimpse of knowledge of that, uh, just sheds a light of, of uh, his creative ability, and uh, it, it humbles me before God. And how foolish would it be for me to have this little speck of knowledge and to think that that's uh, something now I can dispense with God because I, I know a couple of things. So, um, you know, it, to me, it's always God first, and um, I use my science as it, as it can be used, but never to as a replacement for God. And I think I think it's it's quite understandable that that people would look do that and and, and you know, turn science into this god. It's simply because and I, I just the thing that jumps to mind is how people were um, creating uh, you know how it was you know, what would Fauci do you know that was the that was the mantra for a while and and, um, and just where to teach in some among some the friends and colleagues um, almost deified. And I think uh, and it's hard for me to understand coming from a place of of a person of faith, but. I think when people are put under tremendous stress, they want to look for something to put place their hope in. Um, and I think, um, you know, having having Christ as my um, foundation, I don't have to look for that external source um, when the world is crashing around me um, um, as as a as a place to to put my hope in. So I think it's I I, I um, try to look at. Um, people who espouse that with compassion, because that's, I think that's the, where it's coming from is they, they don't have another place to put their hope in. But I think that puts a further burden on me to, to um, be open, more open about where I put my hope um, and where my faith is found. And I, um, but I, I think it's, it's understandable. I cannot imagine how I would have dealt through the last year if I didn't have Christ. I can't imagine. Um, and so I, I understand why people feel that way. Like they needed to put their hope somewhere. Um, and that's, um, and, and I think, you know, I, I can, as, as a person of faith who is also a scientist, um, I, science, is a, science is a wonderful tool um, that's been given to us by God. Um, and to, to use, to better understand the world that he's created. Um, but I think, um, and I think so, someone else had commented in the Q&A about the, 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 the politicization of, of medicine. And I think 
some of that was rolled into the tremendous stress and the unique perspective of, um, of the fact that we have a major infectious disease, which is inevitably going to impact public policy and public policy is politics, even if you don't want it to be. <laughs> um, but I, uh, um, but I think that's, that's the best way I can answer is I think, I think it puts more of a burden on, on me, um, as someone who, you know, but, but for the grace of God, like I have, I have another place to put my hope in. Um, and, um, you know, how, how fortunate am I for that? And, and, further burden to to spread that and or get, you know testify to that hope to others i feel like that is absolutely the perfect beautiful way to um to end this um so i just i would love to pray into that a little bit um and then um i will send us all out into the rest of our night but i before i start us in prayer i do want to say thank you so very very much to our panelists um I mean, both for your faithful witness, um, really just, I, you know, such a powerful witness, um, but also for everything that you've done in this last year, for the people who you have um, been in relationship with, for the people who you have been serving, um, and for the way that you have opened yourself to allowing God's healing power to flow through you. So. Um, I think I speak for all the people on this call um, in saying how very grateful we are that um, you are our brothers and sister in Christ and um, you know that you are, are part of the front line that Jesus has out there making this all happen. So thank you for that. Um, so let's pray for one moment before we send off. Gracious God, um, I, I just give you thanks for these people that you have um, anointed to do your work in this specific way in this specific unusual season. Um, and I thank you for the powerful, faithful and humble way that they are um, going about being your hands and your feet in the world. Um, I thank you for the, the people that they are um, speaking hope to, um, for the ways that they are able to say, Science is important, but my real hope is in Christ. Um, that is the promise that we can cling to. Um, that is our, our only God, our only source of life and hope. So um, we just gave you thanks for that. Um, we ask that you bring healing to the many, many who continue to suffer. Um, we ask that you bring us safely through this pandemic in the way that only you are able to. And we ask that you continue to support and sustain our um, brothers and sisters on the front lines and on the back lines in healthcare, um, and that you will bring them forward into a new light. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again um, to all of you for being on this call. Um, and I um, look forward to um, seeing you on calls for Christian Union in the future. Take care. <laughs>